Hello, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to Blow Up, Show Me the Money. I don't have my cool vocoder tonight. It's like I don't know what to do. <laughs> welcome as well to everyone who was with us last night for uh, Test Lab, Who Wants to Be, uh, and who participated in uh, this game show about uh, participatory democracy and uh, how we spend collective money. Uh, Test Lab and uh, Blow Up decided to do a double header uh, this time, so uh, we share an interest in uh, the notions of cultural value, uh, the cultural economy, uh, and just money in general. So we formulated this double header program uh, where last night there was a really exciting game show uh, about spending collective money, and tonight we're going to get into some of the higher level issues with our expert guests. So tonight we're exploring basically this nature of the, the relationship between money and culture. And I just want to share with you a quick, uh, quick story that hit the news recently. We know, okay, money, it's all over the news uh, lately. <laughs> you know, the Eurozone about to collapse, America can't pay her bills, et cetera, et cetera. So money is really in everyone's, uh, everyone's minds. But um, in the art world, it, it, it also comes out in interesting ways. Jonathan Jones uh, is a writer for The Guardian, and he wrote recently on his blog about um, the Gagosian Gallery in Los Angeles uh, had to postpone an exhibition for a money-related reason. Uh, performance and conceptual artist Chris Burden uh, had uh, devised a piece that involved 100 kilograms of gold bricks. So Gagosian purchased these, and uh, Jonathan Jones asks, wow, how much does 100 kilograms of gold bricks even cost? Any math whizzes out there want to hazard a guess? <laughs> and uh, Gagosian bought it from a company called Stanford Coins and Bullion. Jones goes on to say, this company is a sub subsidiary of Stanford Financial Group. That is, it's part of the empire of Texas financier Alan Stanford, who is now at the center of a massive fraud investigation. Now, announces Gagosian, the gallery's gold has been frozen while the SEC investigates Stanford. So, not only is uh, money causing havoc in, the, in, the, in the, our personal lives and in the art market, but art itself, made with money, is at the center of a fraud investigation. Wonderful. Will wonders never cease? So tonight, we're going to dive into these issues and the issues of funding, and I need, probably don't need to explain much about the, the uh, dire situation up, up coming here in the Netherlands for cultural funding, as well as numerous other uh, countries around the world. We'll get into that in our discussions. How we're going to structure the evening is we're going to kick off with three opening provocations from our expert guests, Saul Albert, Diane Ragsdale, and Hans Abing. And then afterward, we're going to magically switch to the interactive Takayoki table. Um, in the interim, you'll be able to grab one of our zillionaire cocktails from the bar, so during that uh, quick changeover. And the, the Takayoki table, we'll probably describe a little bit more to, uh, about it to you later, um, but as you can see, it's a very cool-looking object, first of all. Um, and second of all, it's, uh, it's got a host in the center that, uh, that leads the discussion and encourages people to, to jump in with their thoughts um, in a very dynamic way. It's also really informal, so feel free to... We want you to come up and sit at it and really close to it, but you're not obliged to stay there, so it's very, very casual. Come, sit down, have a chat. Um, and then get up and, and leave whenever you feel like leaving, and the flow will just happen around the table quite naturally. So that's our format for tonight. Um, and then, so now, without anything too much further, I want to welcome the first guest to the stage, Saul Albert, who's a researcher in the Interaction, Media, and Communication Group at Queen Mary University of London. Welcome, Saul. Uh, thank you very much, MK. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm here in two capacities. Oh, actually, Rick, would you uh, get a slideshow? Oh. Thanks, Richard. Get a slideshow going from last night. So I'm here in two capacities. Uh, one is as a member of this panel, which I'm very, uh, very happy to, to be on. Um, and the other is as a member of the People Speak Collective, uh, with Rick and Jolti up there. Jolti will be hosting Tokyoki tonight. And um, what we did last night, uh, which some of you probably experienced, I know you did, Sophia, and, and some more of you, all of the members of the amazing V2 crew, um, helped to run this game show, which is how I'm going to introduce a few provocations, I hope, on, on the subject of value uh, in art and of art. So 
uh, Who Wants to Be? It's a direct democracy game show. And if you read the propaganda on the flyers that are lying around the place, you'll find out that um, the game show is composed of a, uh, a simple premise, which is that the people who come pay 10 euros in this case, and then have three hours to decide how to spend their collective pot of funds, which last night was 350 euros. And it's run like a game show. So there's a host, um, there is uh, incredible uh, lights, music, and action supplied by <laughs> Richard and Evo. We had uh, Michelle as the voice of reason with a kind of um, sort of violently judgmental attitude to anybody who just bumbled their lines or couldn't figure out what they were talking about. The audience suggests ideas and then there's a voting process. But the, the crucial thing that I wanted to introduce about this game, to those of you who weren't there, is that the rules um, were iterated out by a series of, I think, 13 audiences. So this, this is iteration 13 of Who Wants to Be. And the game started its life as a, a simple majority rules premise. And 100 or as many, I think we got 60 of our friends, families, my mum. We had to really bully people to come to this, all of our mums actually. We had to bully people to come to this event because it was so difficult to sell this slightly stupid idea and convince them that it was fun, um, which in fact it wasn't. The first one was a nightmare um, because the rules didn't work. There were not enough rules. There was just this majority vote premise. So everybody had come, they brought their money, <coughs> Excuse me. And um, they had to make a series of votes in order to change the rules. So the, the, I guess the, the, the main thing that I wanted to impart with the introduction of Who Wants to Be is that the rules are modified according to the current rules. And that's how we've got to the shape of the game as we had it last night, which is a much more polished experience. In fact, which wasn't modified very much by the participants, if at all. Although there are some really good ideas, actually, uh, that, that hopefully we'll be able to incorporate um, according to the rules, which means it has to be voted on next time. But there was this interesting moment um, from the first Who Wants to Be, <clears throat> which really forms the basis for my understanding um, that I'm going to try and relate about the value of this cultural practice and of cultural practice in general, um, which happened when the audience made the first significant rule change that created an articulated functional um, game, which was that they elected a voice of reason. So the majority rules process created this kind of snapping from one decision to the next um, without any sense of contradiction. So people voted to do one thing and then they'd vote to do another and then they'd spend 45 minutes talking about how to do something else and it would get obliterated by the, the subsequent vote. So eventually, in frustration, they voted to have an adjudicator, Julie Freeman, who got up there with a whiteboard and wrote down the rules and wrote down the votes. And if somebody tried to make a decision or vote for a decision that didn't, didn't abide by the existing rules, she would challenge it. And that was the role that Michelle played last night. But the interesting thing that happened at that moment was that it was a, almost a... A, a, a kind of Skynet moment of, of or a singularity, an audience singularity, where suddenly not only did the audience have ideas and voices and uh, these contrived abilities to express their preference, they had an articulated set of rules which enabled them to make decisions and progress in some way with, oh, thank you, yes. and, and progress in their own terms. So, I guess the way that I would relate this, maybe a bit tenuously to the topic of, of uh, the economy at large, is um, partly with the question that is answered very easily by who wants to be, which is what is this worth? What is this cultural activity worth? So in the case of who wants to be last night, maybe it was worth 10 euros to each person. And then when everybody arrived and they realized actually we have 350 euros, the value system at, at play, in play uh, became amplified by that kind of massified budget. But both the value of money that people had placed in the hat and the process that they used 
to decide how to spend it, I would argue were completely consumed by the experience of interacting with one another in a way that had this articulated sense of dynamism, but actually was about something incredibly underdetermined. What are we going to do and how are we going to do it? And I think that this is a common thread in many forms of art practice, which you might recognize in, a lots, in other forms of valuing art. So typically in a regeneration process, which many of you, I know that Amsterdam especially has this reputation as a kind of uh, cultural, a city with a cultural economy, and this is also true of London. Um, there's a real recognition of the regenerative potential, um, the quantified regenerative potential of an art practice. And it really is about the ways in which um, a cultural articulation of meaning in an area or of an area will amplify its value in some way. And I think that this, uh, this process is based not on any quantifiable, uh, measurable relationship, although you could look at, say, house prices and who's living in this area. The ways in which an area becomes uh, acculturated um, don't necessarily relate directly to the increase in property values or the proliferation of small businesses. That's, we make that assumption, but it's not, there's no evidence to support that, really. It's just a feeling that we have. But perhaps that feeling comes from um, the forms of value that are articulated in the ways that people communicate to each other through art. And I guess that's, that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's the form of value in art that I would like to introduce to this discussion. And I know that there will be other forms or uh, reflections on value in art. But I want to talk about this um, understanding of art as a mediator of understanding between people. So it's kind of a, a, a uh, sorry, an, it's a phenomenological view of art that sees, that sees it not as, uh, say, an instrument of speculative value, or, which is often the, the, the kind of trap that I feel forced into by many of my friends who have a kind of Marxist materialist dogma about art and its role in a marketplace, or as in its role as a regeneration, as part of a cultural regeneration process, um, I really think there is an opportunity to look for uh, the, the ways in which an artwork makes itself available as a vehicle for people to communicate and to repair their understanding of what it is that they're talking about, what culture they inhabit together, and of each other's uh, opinions and views on that subject. So, I guess um, that's the overview. The detail, which is really where I think the, the value of this is, the value of this view of art, or the ways in which value is articulated through this view, are about the structural nature of conversation. And when I'm talking about conversation, I'm very much informed by uh, the work that I've been exposed to quite recently at Queen Mary um, in conversation analysis, in a, a view of conversation that sees um, the detailed structures of the ways that people converse as constitutive of uh, an understanding of what's happening around us and what's available to us um, that is very underdetermined. So uh, typically a conversation analyst, and some of you may be familiar with the situationist views, situationist sociology, sorry, I shouldn't say situationist without qualifying it, that I'm talking about sociology of Irving Goffman. And uh, the way of looking at um, cultural artifacts that sees them as situations where people have to take advantage of what's around them in order to understand a completely abstract series of utterances, noises, um, cultural meanings that we couldn't possibly attribute a meaning to apart from by trying to repair one another's understanding of it. So I listen to you and uh, I don't understand what you're talking about, but by conversing, there are structural um, articulations that we make of one another's 
uh, of one another's turn taking, of one another's um, misunderstandings, in which we can start to see uh, the work being done to establish meaning. And that's the work that I see happening in uh, Who Wants to Be, and in many cultural artifacts, many artworks that, um, that articulate the value of people's um, shared perceptions. And that's not going to help us very much in our discussion of how do we get funding for our culture, and it may not be particularly compatible with forms of value uh, that have to be a lot more accountable. But I think it, it starts to show how um, this understanding of um, aesthetics, essentially, can start to influence uh, other forms of value in other cultural areas. And I think in this case, art is a special case. I think I'm pretty much out of time, so I'll wrap up. The argument that I'd make for aesthetics as a special case of conversation is that when we have a conversation about art, when we have a conversation about culture, or when we're involved in this kind of um, ask the audience game show, we don't really know what we're talking about, and it's okay. Because when we're having an aesthetic discussion or discussing a piece of art, what we say to each other is, well, there isn't a right answer. And that's acknowledged before we begin. Almost every other situation or many other situations, there's a far more determined set of uh, premises for our discussion. I'm a doctor. You're a patient. We're talking about your problem. These are much more determined relationships, or they seem like much more determined relationships. But I think once we've established that in an artistic discussion or an aesthetic discussion, there isn't necessarily a right and wrong answer, then the only reason that we're talking to each other is because we enjoy it, is because we get value from it, is because there's something constitutively valuable about having this conversation where we start to understand one another through the cultural objects at play. So, I hope that that is somewhat provocative and that it provides at least a counterpoint to some of the more um, materialist or romantic ideas about what an art object is and how we should value it. Thanks very much, Saul. Um, I also thought maybe it would be interesting to talk about the, um, the outcomes of last night a little bit and the, the projects that, that, that made it to the final round here at V2 in this, in this experiment of who wants to be. Um, I was pretty surprised that we ended up as our final three ideas that were generated by the audience um, donating the money to a food bank, um, cr creating a junior who wants to be, so basically doing another um, event but for, for the kids. Um, and then uh, getting a new doorbell for V2, um, combined with a little plaque with everyone's name on it, uh, who was there to, to facilitate this new doorbell for V2, and the doorbell won. So uh, this was quite surprising to me. <laughs> you know, food bank, people are hungry, it's Christmas, nah. The children, nah. Doorbell, yeah, excellent. It's, uh, it said something to me kind of interesting about this, um, when you make decisions collectively, sometimes, you know, it's interesting to see which ideas float to the top, isn't it? All right. Anyway, thanks a lot, Saul. Sorry for butting in and adding another conclusion to your, to your talk. Uh, now I want to welcome uh, Hans Abing to the stage. And he's an artist uh, and an economist. And he's also working in, um, he's working in sociology as well these days. He's wearing many hats. Welcome. Nowadays, when we mention money, well, we have all lots of thoughts, and usually, usually we go to the euro, that sort of thing. But if you mention money and art in the Netherlands, you immediately think of the cuts, the cuts, um, which are pretty tough, uh, and we notice them all also in V2, I think, some organizations more, some less, and everybody is, in our circles, is very, very angry, very emotional also. Um, they're not, they're quite drastic all at once, but we still stay 
pretty much on top of the, we have still much more funding than they have in Britain and quite a few other countries. So the excitement is, uh, yeah, it's really to do with the Netherlands and the idea that the Netherlands was al always very generous because even abroad uh, people now talk about the Netherlands and how bad it is and uh, it's amazing. You get to Poland and they all mention the Netherlands. So the art lobby in the, in the, Hol in the Netherlands is actually more effective abroad than it is in, in Holland itself, because the cuts stay and they won't <laughs> disappear. Um, what's interesting is that it's so uh, emotional. Um, if, if we read this uh, invitation, it says, I don't know who wrote it, it doesn't matter. The Stroman argument usually goes that hospitals are more important than art galleries. But is a society with no cultural expression worth living? Well, who's going to say that there's no cultural expression when we have some cuts? You know, it's completely exaggerated. And <laughs> but in a way, this emotionality is still a good sign because we still have this respect for art and we, we go for it and whatever. Even the opposite, you know, like the woman in the museum uh, saying, pointing at a painting by Karl Appel, oh, my daughter of six could do this. Yeah? She's also emotional and she, she uh, shows that there's still a lot of respect for art. Art is loaded with value. So in a way, if you're worried about the financing of the arts, I'm not so worried about these uh, right-wing people like the PVV, because they still are in the same sort of yeah, frame of mind that art is so very important and you have to respect it, and they don't. So they have to show that they're against it. Well, actually, the sort of yeah, carelessness with which the uh, Secretary of State is approaching the same topic is maybe far more to worry about if you worry about he doesn't care so much. And there's something new going on. It's like the respect of art is no longer natural, which it has been for two, uh, uh, for two centuries. So I would just very quickly put it into a very long-term perspective. And um, okay, this is a sort of advertisement. I always think uh, artists and even scientists should beca become be, be a bit more commercially oriented, also artists. Um, a legitimization crisis. Um, yeah, well, that's what I said. Um, I'm thinking in terms of an art period. Um, and it's uh, the period in which there is much respect for art. And the respect is of this nature that if you go to a clas classical concert, you're not just yeah, celebrating classical music, no, you're celebrating art. You feel connected with the other arts, you feel it's the arts or art. Well, if you go to a pop concert, you don't worry about other uh, directions in the art, it's just pop music. Yeah? So it's this strange connection that you connect with the world of art if you go to these uh, established events. And that sort of started, uh, I would say, in the early uh, 19th century. There's quite a dramatic change uh, f around 1800, but I'm not going to get into that um, because it will take us too far away. Um, but yes, maybe the third point, an extent, existential relationship with art and artists, that of course was a matter of the bourgeois, because, and it was a small group in the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, but still, it, it lasts to the present day, eh? the idea of that you can realize yourself, or at least artists can realize themselves uh, by making art. Um, and we can identify by with these very special people um, and in a way yeah, become a little bit the artist who is a special person who is one of the few who can realize themselves. We all, ever since 1800, there is a wish to be an individual, to realize yourself, uh, but for common people, for ordinary people, it's not a, a possibility, but they can project their wishes on the artist. Okay, it's also a period in which, uh, um, still a bit more of this about this much respect. Um, yes, there's much respect for art, and there still is. Uh, and there are signs of this respect, there are many signs, but one of them are these, yeah, we're still prepared to pay lots of money uh, for art buildings. Uh, a new concert hall in Hamburg, a, uh, a museum in Abu Dhabi, which cost enormous amounts of money. So the willingness to pay for art as, uh, as art, yeah? uh, uh, real art, serious art, is still very large. 
So that's in contradiction with, um, with the problems of these moments. Um, what is very important is, I think, the fifth point, that is, uh, if you want to distinguish yourself with art, if you want to have privileges as artist, as art world, you need a classification. You need to make a distinction between art and entertainment, real art, serious art, and entertainment. And uh, the United States is a very good example of that, where in the beginning of the 19th century, they really had to uh, yeah, establish this uh, classification. And those, in those days in the United States, art, uh, entertainment, it was all mixed. Uh, there were uh, entrepreneurs who could offer both. Even in the same performance, you would have a, a variety, uh, circus, and then uh, pieces from uh, Shakespeare. Um, and so, uh, because they just wanted to make a profit. So in a way, it was democratic. What the bourgeois needed was to take art out, insulate it, and make clear to everybody, not only in their own circles, but also outside, that there is a strong division between art and entertainment. So you have insulation, uh, you have separate buildings, even sometimes separate parts of time, down in the Nowadays in Amsterdam, the Heineken Music Hall is not in the center. It's not a beautiful hall. It's just very efficient. While the uh, Musikgebouw is in the center, it's very, well, still luxurious in all its spaciousness, etc. And then, of course, you have this theater, whatever. So it's insulated and framing is not what we're going to talk about now, but it's the etiquette. You need a different etiquette for serious art events. Um, let's skip the educating others, although it's very important for the logic behind um, wanting to uh, finance the arts, funding for arts, and it still is. Denial of the co economy is important. It's in, though in the 19th century, it was really to do with taking away arts from uh, the commercial area, although you were, of course, uh, dependent on uh, commerce. Um, also, as art institutions, um, be it sometimes commerce towards the, uh, uh, towards the government, um, but yes, in a way, art could flourish in the 19th century because there were markets. There was a market for books, there was a market for um, uh, written music. So actually the take off of art was made possible by the market. But the relationship with the market is always double. And um, it's, uh, let's see, I talk about that, I think. Yeah, um, anti-commercial, uh, an I missing, anti commercial attitudes are, yeah, the outward sign of uh, this problematic relationship of the arts with this uh, commerce and also of the fact that you want to have a division between entertainment and art. And anti-commercial attitudes are very typical for the uh, art world till the present day um, and also for artists. So what artists do is you need money, you need at least some money to be able to, uh, to do your work, but you're not commercial. You're always striving for this maximum of autonomy, which is of course a fake autonomy because you're trying to please your peers, etc. Uh, but still, it feels like you, uh, you, of, you're expected to go for this extreme of autonomy and uh, you expect that from other artists and even the art consumer wants you to go there. Um, and that is, I think, part of the, pro of the present prob problem in the arts. Well, um, then you get this strange paradox that artists are poor, while the value of art is so large. We build very expensive buildings, uh, and yet artists are poor, and that is to do, I would say, with the very large attractiveness of the art profession. So if art, the symbolic value of art is high, if there's much respect for art, uh, if we feel that artists can realize themselves while well, others can only partly or not at all have boring jobs, whatever, um, then you have a problem. Uh, many people want to be artists and uh, the uh, art profession is very attractive, but artists are poor. Um, let's see, well, we, we, inv we, yeah, we invest all sorts of magic into the art. Art is beauty and artists as well. They're creative, authentic, they realize themselves. Okay, um, and then it sits, it's visible from very simple uh, expressions like, oh no, I'm not creative. Yeah? It's at the same moment you put the artist on a footstool. Um, that's talked about, I'm gonna skip this. Okay, so I jump, 
uh, jump to uh, the present day, um, I would call it the art crisis. So my idea is that you have an art period of very much, much respect for the arts. Uh, and it started in the, in the beginning of the 19th century. It became more and more important. And now it's gradually coming to a close. So some, uh, there's some signs that, that it's already almost done, but there are many signs that uh, it says that it's still going to be a long time. Um, but of course, the uh, classification between, especially between art and entertainment, or real art, serious art, and pop music is becoming less clear. And the activities of V2, in a way, are promoting that. Even though you may not want it, or some people may not want it, it's happening. Um, Commercialization, yes, uh, art is becoming more commercial, although I think most artists still have this anti-commercial attitude and play a little bit with commerce rather than really engage in it. Um, but there is some change there. And, um, and in that sense, art is becoming more democratic, whatever way you turn it. Um, well, no, in some sense, it's becoming more democratic uh, by by a less strong uh, division between uh, uh, popular art and, um, and uh, serious art. Um, well, the it's second, but the dwind dwindling audiences, that is, of course, a huge worry at the moment. Um, uh, you know, the classical concert, people are not, there are not man that many people coming anymore. Um, museums are doing slightly better, but it is a problem. It's an ever smaller part of the uh, society which, uh, uh, yeah, takes part in what we call uh, serious uh, art. And that results in a legitimization crisis, but there's the other side of it, and that's professional professionalization. I think uh, artists are becoming more professional, um, also in the sense that they, yes, they do want an audience, and they do want, at least I hope, I do, they want, do, do want to make a decent living because that's quite crucial, that artists say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to, to do all this work, etc., but I want at least a decent living, so not work for ridiculously low uh, incomes. And then, well, maybe some have to leave or will leave. There will be fewer artists, but um, it's normalizing it a little bit. So um, there is an artist, artist elite, and it has many privileges, but it's coming uh, it's becoming less attractive. You lose something when the arts become more democratic and when you, you lose some subsidies, whatever, but it's, um, uh, you also gain in this more democratic surrounding. Okay, let's leave it at this. Was it how many? Five minutes. You said I have five more minutes? I'm being so fast. <laughs> okay. Um, Well, let's leave it at this. We, can, we get back to it in the discussion. Uh, what did I do with my, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> this is a new one for me, the speaker that, that uh, doesn't want more time. <laughs> but anyways, thanks uh, very much, Hans. Um, and now I'd like to uh, welcome our final speaker to the stage, Diane Ragsdale, who's a blogger and a researcher at Erasmus University. Give her a warm welcome. Thank you. If I, if I close this laptop, is that, that won't hurt anything, right? OK, great. Thanks. It's great to be here. Um, among the topics we were asked to think about for this evening, um, one was the question, is the American model the ideal? And since I'm from the US and have spent time on both sides of that model, both raising and earning revenue, running arts organizations, and also giving it away, working at a, a major philanthropic foundation, uh, I thought I'd speak on this topic. So one of the more interesting developments in the US in the recent weeks has been the Occupy Wall Street movement. Um, the protests, which started September 17th in the financial district in New York City, um, are against economic and social inequality, growing unemployment, greed, and corruption, uh, including the influence of corporations, and most notably banks, on the government. The slogan of the movement, we are the 99%, refers to the growing disparity in the US between the wealthiest 1% and the rest of us. 
The Occupy Wall Street movement has spawned other Occupy movements here, across Europe, across the United States, and it's also recently begun to spawn an interesting conversation in the U.S. arts and culture sector about our own social and economic inequalities. A recent report by the National Committee for Responsive Philanthropy called Fusing Arts, Culture, and Social Change states that arts nonprofits in the U.S. with budgets over $5 million, which represent 2% of all arts nonprofits, capture 55% of all arts contributions, gifts, and grants. The report's author, Holly Sidford, writes, and I'm going to quote extensively here, um, a few paragraphs uh, because it's, it's good and I can't say it better. Every year, approximately 11% of foundation giving, more than 2.3 billion in 2009, is awarded to nonprofit arts and culture. At present, the vast majority of that funding supports cultural organizations whose work is based in the elite segment of the Western European cultural tradition, commonly called the canon and whose audiences are predominantly white and upper income. A much smaller percentage of cultural philanthropy supports the arts and traditions of non-European cultures and the non-elite expressions of all cultures that comprise an increasing part of American society. An even smaller fraction supports arts activity that explicitly challenges social norms and propels movements for greater justice and equality. This pronounced imbalance restricts the expressive life of millions of people, thus constraining our creativity as a nation. But it is problematic for many other reasons as well. It is problematic because it means that in the arts, philanthropy is using its tax-exempt status primarily to benefit wealthier, more privileged institutions and populations. It is a problem because our artistic and cultural landscape includes an increasingly diverse range of practices, many of which are based in the history and experience of lower income and non-white peoples, and philanthropy is not keeping pace with these developments. And it, is, and it is a problem because art and cultural expression offer essential tools to help us create fairer, more just, and more civic-minded communities and these tools are currently underfunded." End quote. The Fusing Culture Report has taken the field by storm, but it isn't really news. It's more the timely reissuing of news we've known for a while now. A few weeks ago, a fellow arts and culture blogger based in North Carolina, a theater professor and practitioner named Scott Walters, wrote a series of posts called Occupy Lincoln Center. Lincoln Center is the arts campus on the Upper West Side of Manhattan whose anchor tenants include the Metropolitan Opera, the New York Philharmonic, Lincoln Center Theater, and the New York City Ballet, among the wealthiest arts organizations in the city and the country. In his second Occupy Lincoln Center post, Walters references a speech given 15 years ago by the great playwright August Wilson at the annual conference of professional nonprofit theaters in the US. Wilson said, of the 66 Lort resident theaters, there is only one that can be considered black. From this, it could be falsely assumed that there aren't sufficient numbers of blacks working in the American theater to sustain and support more theaters. If you do not know, I will tell you that black theater in America is alive. It is vital. It just isn't funded. Black theater doesn't share in the economics that would allow it to support its artists and supply them with meaningful avenues to develop their talent and broadcast and disseminate ideas crucial to its growth. The economics are reserved as privilege to the overwhelming abundance of institutions that preserve, promote, and perpetuate white culture." End quote. We now think of the American model as meaning minuscule levels of direct support from government, with approximately 40 to 50% of revenues coming from the box office or in other ways earned, and another 35 to 45% from private support or endowment earnings. But this was not always the case. Apocryphal as it now seems, in the 1960s and 70s, the US government, the National Endowment for the Arts, as well as state and local governments, 
provided significant direct support to many nonprofit arts groups. This enabled artists and organizations to take artistic risks and encouraged, among other things, the democratization of the arts and the development of diversity, preservation, access, and education initiatives, and the formation of many black theaters and other ethnically specific arts groups. As the Fusing Culture Report confirms, not all arts organizations or programs fared equally in the fallout from cuts and shifts in priorities at the NEA and other foundations in the 1990s. In particular, community-based, grassroots, artist-led, folk, and culturally specific organizations, as well as smaller, alternative groups that support emerging artists and produce challenging works, have often struggled to develop and sustain a sufficient base of individual donors to support their institutions. It would seem that when the government cuts funding to the arts and culture, and culture sector, it cannot assume that society will dutifully and equitably fill all the gaps. There will be winners and losers. It's hard to be competitive in the U.S. system without a battalion of development staffers, high-profile CEOs on your board, access to celebrities that can perform at your annual gala, and an impressive and aesthetically pleasing venue in which to display the names of your donors on a wall, or perhaps a small plaque by the doorbell. Some look at the continued growth of the nonprofit art sector, despite the lack of direct government support, as a sign of its entrepreneurialism. The rhetoric increasingly adopted by governments in Europe and elsewhere as they announce their planned cutbacks in the arts sectors is that a shift to something more akin to the American model will result in a more relevant, creative, and sustainable arts sector. Alive and large, perhaps. Relevant and innovative, I'm not so sure. Johns Hopkins-based researcher Lester Solomon calls the nonprofit sector in the U.S. the resilient sector. In his 2003 monograph of the same name, he addresses the evolution of the sector in the face of not only loss of subsidies, but a host of other problems. He asserts that U.S. nonprofits have proven to be extremely resilient, but that the strategies that they have employed to survive and thrive have, over time, moved them away from their missions. He identifies five risks facing the nonprofit sector that go to the heart of what make it, it distinctive and worthy of public support. A growing identity crisis, increased demands on nonprofit managers. I know one artistic director who has dinner with donors more than 200 nights a year, as an example. Increased threat to nonprofit missions, a disadvantaging of small agencies, and the potential loss of public trust. And there's another issue. Arts organizations, large arts organizations, have continued to grow in size, not only in an uncertain funding environment, but as Han said, in the face of declining demand. Orchestras, for example, have continued to build massive endowments, even while playing to houses that are half full. In the US winner-take-all system, the winners are, too often, the zombies large, historically leading, walking dead organizations with dwindling, aging subscribers. The losers are the artistic innovators. As an example, in June, it was announced that the resident theater company, Florida Stage, would be filing for Chapter 7 bankruptcy protection and closing its doors. For weeks, I was haunted by the thought that the American theater had just lost an organization without fully grasping the critical role that it played in the arts ecosystem. It appears that the move to a new space was a key factor in its financial troubles and eventually left the company saddled with a $1.5 million debt, significant for a theater of its size. Florida Stage was one of the mid-sized gems in the regional theater in the U.S. Mid-sized is a very dangerous position to be in the U.S. arts and culture sector. The theater had a national reputation for producing new work and was a founding and leading member of a consortium of mid-sized theaters in the U.S. that worked together to co-commission and produce new plays. Despite its significant importance to many artists and to developing new work in theater, there was no rallying cry, really, to save Florida Stage. At the same time, 
we continue to see large, historically leading institutions, evidently too big to let fail, get resuscitated multiple times. It seems they have something more important than relevance. They have control of, or at least the ability to influence, the levers of the system. In closing, a Stanford Business School professor once gave me the following definition. A model is a representation of your beliefs about causality. If the American model is failing, perhaps this is because the beliefs underpinning it were wrong, at least some of them. Beliefs, for instance, that the system would value artists and artistic innovation, that it would have the discipline and ability to encourage death in underperforming organizations and thereby enable creative destruction in the sector rather than its calcification, that nonprofits would always prioritize their missions over survival at all costs and would say no to money that would corrupt them, that donors would look beyond their own self-interests and would give funds aimed at serving the greater good, and that the plurality of the system would result in diversity. Of course, there is another possibility that the American model is not broken, that it is functioning exactly as it was intended to function, that it is serving the institutions and members of the community that it was designed to serve, and that the 1% versus 99% economic and social inequities are entirely by design. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diane. That was very thought-provoking. And now, uh, I don't want to break the flow too much, but we're going to wheel the table into the center, and we're going to get together around the Takeoki, and we're going to hash out these thoughts around the 99%, the 1%, the artist, why are artists poor, why did V2 get a new doorbell. Let's get together and talk about these things. But first, go pick up a free zillionaire cocktail, and then we'll join us at the, at the Takeoki table middle of the bright and uh, you are very welcome to to join me and Saul Albert and uh, what's your name sorry oh all right sorry uh, maybe it was a bit too quick from me so we have Michelle and Saul and um, probably hopefully soon more people sitting here if you after you grabbed your zillionaire cocktail which I think is amazing yeah. Maybe you don't know, but you're actually drinking gold. Do they know this? Yeah, you probably know this, you're drinking gold. Uh, so this is Tokyo, okay? uh, all the way from London. And this is, as I said, is a mobile chat show. Um, there are no real rules. There are a few rules, not that many. No singing and no punch-ups. But a part of that, you are very welcome to come down, put down your drink and uh, your views on many of the things. Well, yeah, we will figure out. Um, so, hello, uh, well, Diane, um, I don't know, is there, is, I think we heard lots of things, interesting thoughts uh, about the state of art and funding and economics and um, I don't know, uh, have you, well, what did you think, did you, did you hear something interesting from, your, uh, from the other speakers, who, who was your favorite speaker, what was the most interesting thing you heard? Anything you can also talk about something completely different things. You want, you can talk about football. You want to talk about football? No, not really. You want to talk about art? Well, maybe a bit more than I want to talk about football. <laughs> right, yeah. right, right. Uh, oops, hang on. I just got tangled. Here you go. So I was Hans. I was really taken with your um, thought about the end of the art period. Right, the ship. And one thing that it feels like to me in the U.S. is that the elite institutions and their stakeholders and funders know that they're increasingly irrelevant, know that they're endangered, and in fact are fighting to preserve them against the fact that, that the rest of society is not getting out of them. Is that, how, I mean, is that part of what this movement means to you? I think you're perfectly right. Um, there, there is some sort of a desperate... Uh, notion uh, in the present uh, situation, both by elite institutes, but also by yeah, people like you and me. 
in the art world. Uh, and the funny thing is that we still want to keep together. Like we have the same cause, we have the same problems, cuts are going to cut, uh, yeah, suffer, we are all going to suffer from the cuts. Well, they actually we have very different positions. You know, um, the, the, the um, Concertgebouw has completely different interests than uh, the V2. And uh, so, I'm, yeah, still this idea that, that we could all be in the same cause and that uh, art is going to be harmed, um, yeah, it's uh, serves to keep the division between, between art and popular music, uh, popular art, which is in the interest of the art world. Okay, and I, f I found it really interesting. Uh, that was my, I don't know, it's most controversial bit about, uh, as you said, uh, popular art and serious art, which I found like, ooh, that's, that's, that's going to f uh, spark some really interesting uh, thoughts around the table. Uh, come, please do come a little bit closer because I can't reach all the way to you. And uh, you too, please, uh, I, because I have to reach you and I have to figure out what's your name because otherwise we don't know who we are actually talking to. So what's your name? Martijn. Martijn. Uh, what's your name? Madeleine. Madeleine. Diane. Diane. So. It's yours. Tom. Okay, well, I need a really long arm now. Sarah. Sarah. Um, Hans. Hans. Michel. Michel. So, uh, but it's, it's not like a panel session, so it's, uh, what we want to avoid is like these experts talking it being, being between themselves. So, uh, I think it's very, if, I mean, if you have any thoughts, did you, did you figure out something what you didn't know before? Uh, then you can please raise your questions. Uh, the, the assumption, the silent assumption in the last talk was that uh, subsidy would have to be distributed equally. Was this, can she make this explicit? Does she really think oh, it should be uh, equally distributed? Well, how, 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 yeah, it's raised this question. How do you distribute equally? Do you have to be like a better artist and then you get more money or you, everyone gets the same lump of money regardless of their merits? I'm curious, how would that work? Uh, how would what work? The distribution, how I guess. It, like, how would it work if I was an artist or an artist organization and, and you were a cultural funder? How would it work that we would all get the same amount of money? I, I am curious as well because it's not my assumption. Yeah, I don't, I don't think equal distribution is the point. I think that it's that the, that the distribution seems to be aligned with the interests of a very small number of people um, who, who, who give their money part of which is their own money, but part of which is U.S. tax dollars and is supposed to represent the interests of American society. But if they give all of their money towards the interests that are their own, then, th then that's a problem. So I don't think it has to be equal distribution, but I think somehow, uh, the, you know, it's almost like they're functioning more like country clubs, right? Like people who just were just paying money to patronize this thing that we really love, and, and yet half of that money is g could have been paid to the taxes and could have benefited society. And that's the interesting thing about the American model. Okay, so it's interesting. So how, how could we figure out the system? Or is there a way to distribute this money in a better way? So as you're saying, it's, not, it's a very elitist kind of system which only supports their own people. But, but isn't, I mean, the image of the theater director going out for 200 dinners with donors really stuck in my mind. I mean, these people are also seriously hustling. I mean, uh, so is it the people who... Uh, Hustle the hardest also, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I feel like there's something incredible in that. 200, 200 dinners, I missed that It's also one. a massive waste of money. 200 dinners, sounds like a great use of money. <laughs> you know, you have to make connections. It's like, a, it's part of your life. If you are a theater, I mean, is it, is it, is it good? Do you think it's, it's right to, for theater direct directors to go out and have dinners every second day? Is it, is it viable? Is it part of the, your lifestyle? Or is it, is it, is it outrageous? You don't have to do groceries. Can you, you come closer? You don't have to do groceries. Oh, you don't? Oh, okay. Well, I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know, too. However, I would like to address another point, actually, that Michelle once pointed to me, and she's not from the Netherlands. I am. And she said that she valued the culture the cultural system in the Netherlands so high 
since she thought about it as the as Holland's business cards toward the world, and it was said also today that the the Dutch system was valued actually higher abroad than in the Netherlands, and I thought that was a very interesting point she said, and I never thought about it like this, so maybe others would like to to share their thoughts about that because I think that's that's a real yeah maybe not so good to prove value we have here, but I think it's very important though as a small country. Mm, okay, so what, what uh, do we know about this very interesting uh, model? What, what's, the, what's the uniqueness? Maybe is it, did you talk about this uh, unique model before? I just missed it out or is it something that you would like to, to share it with more people? It, who was might just, it was just, I mean, for a, a country of uh, such a small size to have such an outsized reputation for culture, I mean, it's better than having a reputation for, I don't know, terrible things, you know, I mean, so, yeah. and, it's, and it's something that uh, was a real, you know, um, how do you make an impact as a small nation? You know, culture is a really great calling card. It's really, it's, it's, it's so cheap for what you get, actually, in return as well. But we keep making this economic argument about how cheap, you know, culture is great value for money, you know, whatever, you get X five tourist dollars back for every one you spend on culture. I don't know why that's not convincing anymore. You know, does anyone wonder why, you know? Maybe, maybe agriculture is better. I mean, yeah, and who knows if it's true or not, but also, I think that the economic impact arguments are effective, but we just don't understand the impact that they're having. I mean, in the U.S., what you see, uh, we're holding on to the organizations that are big, that have, you know, economic impact, and we don't value what it means to be an arts organization that maybe serves a small constituency or serves poor people who don't bring in a lot of dollars or who don't go out to eat restaurants beforehand and don't hire babysitters and don't drive in taxis or whatever else. You know, so I think the economic impact arguments do have effect, but I'm not sure in the long run they're the effect you want to have if what you're really trying to say is, you know, culture should be valued because uh, it contributes to the conversation and to meaning and things like that. Okay. Uh, well, we, we have more people around here, so I would like to get as many names as is possible. What's your name? Uh, Elise. Hello. Christina. Christina. Oh. Martin. Again. Martin, Hi. again. Yeah, please bad at you. Yeah. Okay. Daniela. Oh. Oh, Madeleine. Diane. Diane. So. Joris. We had this thing before, I know, just a second ago, but now we have more people and we have to make sure that we, we know the name. Shouldn't the question be how the Dutch cultural um, society should be able to generate their own income rather than be um, dependent on subsidy? Because until now they have been, and maybe you're not, you know, you don't agree with the way that funds are distributed within the U.S., but U.S. cultural organizations have managed to put together a substantial private funding, which has not happened in the Netherlands. And there are other countries where governments do not pump money into cultural activities, and I think the U.S. model is an interesting one to look at in terms of how a free economy operates, um, and I think Dutch theaters or cultural institutions need to be less dependent on subsidies and more creative in finding their own funding. And shouldn't that be the issue? Yes, I think this this should be the question. Uh, subsidies <laughs> versus, versus uh, self-contained, self-supporting uh, system of artists who can come up with new economic models and or teach lessons. Or being more creative in, in attracting an audience. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so maybe do you think that artists could use their creativity to come up with something a different way of, of supporting themselves? Can you come a bit closer because I... Uh, just can't walk out from here and encapsulate it. Yeah, we can we can find a chair for you. It's, 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 it kind of works in a way. People who speak more can uh, get better chairs, and then the ones who don't will be pushed behind. Uh, I'm really interested in this idea of conversation because this is a fundamental part of um, any kind of selling, buying, selling transaction. If you go into a shop, you have a conversation with somebody who's sort of... Uh, you know, sitting behind the counter, or, you know, if you're actually trying to sell a project on a large scale, you have a conversation with whoever's going to fund you. So there's this kind of ongoing question and answer thing going on, where people are exchanging ideas and querying each other and challenging each other. And that seems to me to be sort of a fundamental part of it. So I kind of think that maybe that sort of aspect of fostering conversation among sort of artists and their audience is perhaps really sort of part of the... Um, the, you know, the core of this. Mm -hmm. Do we think that there is no, do you think there is a conversation between artists and, and, and uh, punters or is it just they just walk in and they just, oh, what's going on? Uh, is, 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 is there, is, do you think 
do we think that's the case? There is a, do you think there's enough conversation? No, I think it's often blocked by institutions who are, me, who are sort of supposedly intermediaries fostering relationships between artists and society, but I think more than not become barriers for, mm -hmm. for that kind of conversation that could happen between artists directly and the societies that they live in. So you say they, they don't quite understand the, what they rule could be, or they, they're not really good at deciding what is supposed to be the good and serious art. And then, does it mean that we should maybe, do you think the artists should make better communication, or there should be a different body who could decide who is going to get money and who's not? It's the, uh, the tyranny of the institution. I mean, okay. I think that's really the thing, that, that these institutions that have grown up, organizations, I mean, you know, arts organizations that are not, I think, fulfilling the essential role they could fulfill in brokering relationships between artists and society. Mm -hmm. But uh, how do you do that? Can you give an example of, of a proper uh, barrier that they're actually putting? Because I don't, I mean, I see your point, but uh, I don't see actually what uh, concretely, like, what would be a concrete example uh, between the artist and the audience that an institution would put? Well, I think, you know, when you look at the, the degree to which uh, it becomes very hard for, I mean, in some ways, it becomes harder for people but for in the U.S., let's say, to access symphony orchestra concert because ticket prices are high, right? So they can't get into the, organiz they can't get into the institution to start with to even begin to have a relationship or a conversation about that art form. They don't feel welcome in the space because it's gilded and fancy and it doesn't seem like the kind of space that they should go in. They, they see all sorts of signs and, and, and symbols that, that, that make them feel unwelcome. There's not, not enough information. You know, it takes, we, we, don't, we're not, we don't fess up to the fact that art is not always easy to understand, right? And that if, and that, you know, the first time you show up at a place, it's not necessarily intuitive what's going on and where you fit in and how you begin to enter the conversation. So you can either be doing things that are helping to foster that, or you can be doing things that actually make it more difficult for some people to be able to do that. So I think it's that they, that, that at least in the U.S., my experience is that, that that's often what's missing. Okay. Is it, was it an answer for your question? Okay. Uh, you had a point here a second ago, and then I will come back to you, so. Yeah, um, I think we shouldn't make much, that much separation between institutions and artists or even art consumers. Uh, artists are the institutions and, and the other way. We form an institution. And so I think uh, if something wrong is, is wrong with the institutions, it's wrong, wrong with the artists as well. Um, and the artists have this problem of also not being oriented on an audience. You know, already they learn in the schools, which is an institution, of course, but also run by artists, for instance, in art schools. They already learn there that, well, you have to do some marketing, etc. You have separate courses for that, but you have to be an autonomous artist. We, we orient on our peers, and an audience is just an extra. And that's where the, the problem starts. Enter commercial. So? Um, I just wanted to get back to the, the, the sort of model for artistic support and I actually thought, sorry, what's your name again? Don. I thought it, Don's idea that you should, or maybe his misunderstanding, that we should distribute funds equally between anybody who asks for them is quite an interesting one. Um, and it was, in fact, that was how the Greater London Council, which is kind of the Socialist Council of London, um, before uh, Thatcher uh, kind of dis extinguished it. it, used to be run by um, Ken Livingstone, who became the mayor of London, um, in, a, in, a, in a sort of slightly less, uh, less interesting era in the 90s. But basically they gave money to whoever wanted it, um, especially just before they got eclipsed, and they just had to get rid of all their cash. And it started some of the best arts organizations ever, just mm -hmm. these incredible organizations. Nobody in their right mind would give money to these people, but uh, they all got them. And that's where a lot of, especially um, groups that had been typically underrepresented, some of the groups you were talking about, people from ethnic minorities and groups who had been very poorly represented in the cultural funding initiatives of the state, suddenly had loads of money and bought buildings and organized all kinds of stuff. So I quite like the idea that it's just anybody who wants it, and then it runs out, and that's too bad. You just got to write in a bit earlier <laughs> next time. I see, but uh, this, uh, this kind of opens up the question about, well, we, we could also talk about uh, distributing all the goods, not only for artists. So there is a question here. 
about artists and the distribution of the wealth. And I guess it's not only for artists, but maybe we could just stick to the artists for now. I'd like to know why did it stop if it was so successful? Well, it was kind of an accident. It was because in their death throes, they just had to get rid of all their money. So whoever asked for it got it, and then they disappeared. So, I, can, I understand the system, but I feel like I would fear that if everybody who asked for the money got the money, then the pot would just get divided into such small parts that everybody's part would be so small, it would be less than the amount that they're actually putting into the pot in terms of their tax dollars. So they'd be like, oh, yay, I got a euro, when actually I, get, I spend how many euros at the end of the year on their tax dollars. So I kind of get the idea, but I could see how it could be such small slices of the pie that it would actually not be worth it for the artists who are, you know, the time it spends to write the application to get the euro out of it. Maybe it's not worth it. How, how did it work out? How, how much money do you think is the minimum amount? Per application. How much it costs to write an application? Or no, how much how you get? I don't know. If everybody who wants money gets money, then... You can't get a lot of money. No, that, 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 the, the, the question <laughs> was that how much money, how much time would you spend? No, how much money would it make sense to, to write an application for? If it, was it like 100 euros, 300 euros? Was it the question? What's the value of an uh, application? How was your hourly rate? I guess it depends on if it's your first application, second, third. My first, I would go for 25 euros. But my third, maybe I'd go for 350 euros. All right. How many applications have you written so far? More than three. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> right. Here you go. I just wanted to add one point because, of course, it's not about the exact budgets, but it may be about the mechanisms that you use to, to, uh, to allocate money. And one example from the field of research and, and education and innovation is that you have, for instance, uh, innovation vouchers, as they are called in the Netherlands, that are really small budgets. Everyone who applies for it can get one. And, of course, it's, it's 10,000 euro, for example. So as a firm, you can innovate a little bit, but at least it helps you to, to get acquainted, to get some reputation, to get some sponsors maybe even. And then, for example, you have Blue Sky Research, which we have at the European level. And that is not really pre-designed or by any key stakeholders. So in Blue Sky Research, everyone with a good idea is in with a chance. And then, of course, you have the really big programs, and then you need to have to be established. You have to have partners, sponsors, etc. But just to, ex to give an example of little, small, nice mechanisms that can help you to become at least a major player over time. But, I think Diane's point is that it's when you get to the point of these major players, then it cuts off the funding for the other people. So is it the question of, should we keep up with the system of getting to be a major player status or not? Because the major players are the ones that are taking so much from non-major players. If there are only major players and they are not challenged, then we have a big problem. But if they are consistently challenged, then the system is at least a little bit healthier. Uh, I think that's maybe, um, you know, the, the sort of the, the getting to the stage of the major player, so to speak, or getting to the point where you can actually seriously fund your work is actually a measure of the value of your ideas. I mean, I don't think anybody, just anybody can be an artist in much the same way that just anybody can be a doctor. I think you have to have a certain set of talents and a certain set of skills, and uh, you have to have some damn good ideas. So um, I think if you don't actually have that and you don't actually ab you're not actually able to refine uh, your ideas over time and you don't actually pay your dues, then, um, so to speak. Um, and I think that's something which has actually been sort of, uh, you know, missed in contemporary culture is that we're, we're kind of expecting a certain amount of um, instant gratification about these whole, these whole things and there's no expectation that you actually have to sort of sit down and really work on your ideas and make them worthwhile and make them worth something that, that people will actually value them. Okay, so uh, you, you are on the side of standardization of artist practice. You, you, have, to, you have to, okay, but I guess we someone, do, do you some, uh, okay, then it's completely misunderstood. I'll, 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 uh, I'll tell you what I mean. What I miss in contemporary art is serious craftsmanship, is serious attention to detail, is serious, you know, really something that actually gives me a sense that somebody has really thought about this and put some effort into it. You know, real craft, whether it's stagecraft, whether it's musicianship, whether it's, uh, you know, artistry in, in, a, in a kind of physical sense, mm -hmm. whatever that is, I, you know, I want to see that. I want to see somebody who's really, you know, working on what they're doing and, and, and dedicating themselves to it and not somebody who's just... Uh, that's me as an arts consumer, though, really. Uh -huh. I see, I see. So do, do we feel the same? 
I'm going to be devil's advocate. Um, Please do. I think we're mainly Caucasian around the table. Uh, I grew up in South Africa, where in the time of apartheid, um, it was very important to keep the white culture alive, and there was a lot of funding from the government to support white culture. Mm -hmm. uh, that has diminished uh, significantly because it's become more important to build houses for people who live in um, you know, terrible areas. And I mean, culture is a very privileged thing. And I mean, I, I think we all, I assume we all come from sort of privileged backgrounds and it seems very difficult to keep on justifying, subsidizing, you know, something that is not really a, necess a necessity to survive. I value culture, I think it's very important, um, but there are countries where that is not an issue because there are more serious issues at stake. Um, and in that sense, I just, you know, I love culture, I'm a supporter of the arts, um, but I think it needs to be more sustainable than it is. And I think that, for me, still remains the question is how do we make it more sustainable than it is at the moment without relying on subsidies? Okay, well, it's a, it's a really tough topic. How can we make it more sustainable? Is anyone here who is a self-sustaining artist anywhere around here? Or actually, I wanted to, uh, to ask this question. Oh. No, I just want to respond to that one comment. Um, I want to say, speak for yourself. Um, neither of my parents graduated high school. I don't think I'm coming from a privileged background. Coming from a background of Polish toilet cleaners, okay? So... Nope, hang on. No, no, I mean, I, I come from Canada, so what can I say? Like, you know, I mean, but I'm just saying, uh, I don't have a trust fund, right? Uh, can, I, can I have this one back? I, I didn't grow up in a township. I, I mean, I live in a house. I don't I have running water and electricity. There are many people who don't have basic needs. And we're discussing about funding, you know, culture when there are so many other needs that, that need to be looked after and it's you know it's about what you see as a first privilege but I don't have a trust fund either so it's not you know just how you look at what what is privileged I think we're pretty privileged in this case you shouldn't speak for yourself it's statistics and statistically we are a privileged group very much so the parents no no, no. the parents of artists are higher educated earn more than the parents of average uh, university students even so that's it uh, you're an exception, and that's why you're so wonderful, but... <laughs> okay, so we are... Uh, uh, there was this definition of... Uh, okay, here you go. No, but I uh, just wanted to say that this all discussion brings a little bit of uh, what Hans Ebbing said uh, previously about the legitimacy crisis, because, okay, we can talk about reallocation of funds and what funds, but we see that the society uh, up to this point, via some kind of social consensus, uh, has arrived to... Uh, not not being uh, objected against funding arts, but at this mo moment we see that around us society doesn't really arrive at this consensus anymore that art should be funded in general, and then we don't have this legitimacy anymore. So what can we, as people interested in arts, can actually do about improving this, this uh, legitimacy in the first place, so we can really talk about funds or whatnot, because we don't have them anymore. Uh, I wonder what happened to this uh, legitimacy. Um, it oh, I guess, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, well, I'm kind of interested in knowing if people within arts networks are using different ways of supporting themselves other than money. And, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm trying to pioneer a hybrid model for my own life of using money and using other ways of supporting myself. And I'm really interested in, a, in an economy of relationships instead of an economy of transactions. And, um, you know, some things I still, like, I, you know, I need a laptop and I, I use money to buy that, but normal money, the national currency. But then there are other ways of trading and exchanging and supporting your life. And there are, you know, whole groups of people kind of pioneering these ways and setting up alternative currencies which stand side by side with the national currency and enable people to support themselves and have, you know, rich lifestyles without necessarily needing to rely on the national currency or the, the international um, monetary system. So I'm curious to know if anyone knows if there are any artists who are, who are using these kind of models and supporting themselves this way. Who knows alternative solutions? Well, I do know of an artist who's trying as much as possible to do exactly that and to 
replace the exchange of money with exchange of duties. And unfortunately, after, okay, it's only been three, four months, but it's not working. Oh, okay. So, so we'll go, we'll, I'm, I'm interested mean, in this. What, what is he giving back for plumbing or how, how it actually works out? Um, is he like literally gives away performance <laughs> art pieces for the well? It's actually it's in sorry, the, in the it's, not, it's, it's not the exchange of art per se. It's um, it's a circle of if you can to it's a dance organization actually, and mm -hmm. the idea is that you take classes for free mm -hmm. by giving classes yourself. So you can take cl you because you need to as a dancer keep on training in order to produce your artwork, and it costs a lot of money to pay always for classes. So the idea is to, if you teach a class, you can take classes for free. Okay, but and only dance class. There is, there is no other class. Yes, you, can't, you can't run like IT classes uh, okay. in, in return. Maybe this is what will help it work. But at the moment, it's just uh, it's this idea that if you give, you can take okay. for so the exchange. So dance for dance kind of uh, exchange. I, I can kind of see how it can not quite work. Uh, but. I'm sure there are um, other, other, other. Yeah, it's, it's well done. And his goal was exactly that, was to not rely on government funding. He wanted to be completely independent of the government subsidies because noticing that they're going down. He, yeah. wa he wanted to try to create something sustainable with the idea of give and take for free. And yeah, I don't know, maybe it has to do with the... In, my, in the way I'm conducting my life at the moment of hybridizing using national currency and not. And the, one of my friends, Caroline, she um, tried to live for a year without using money, without using normal money. And, uh, and Jars on the Geld, Pontenel, is her, is her website. And it's quite interesting, the relationships that she built and the way that she supported herself through a year. So I think it's not always, it's not always easy to get it started and you make mistakes and think, well, this isn't working, but... I would kind of really encourage your friend to just keep going, keep transforming it, and see see if you can find a model that does work. Personally, what about? I want to go back to something Hans said, which was the the marketplace. Like, and uh, you know, a few uh, several years ago now, like six years ago, there was this uh, sort of little article on you know sort of the gossip column in in one of the New York papers about a supermodel that had been photographed outside of Lincoln Center, outside of the Metropolitan Opera. And the person that caught the photograph and interviewed her briefly said, hey, did you just go to the opera? And she was like, no. And they were like, oh, how come? And she's like, I don't know. Like, none of my friends go. My sense is that it's kind of like a thing that old people do. I don't know. I've never been. And she kind of brushed it off. And this was before Peter Gelb had gone to the Metropolitan Opera. And at the time, you know, their, their average age of their attendees, you know, so let's put it this way, five years prior, the average attender had been 60, and this year, the average attender was 65. In other words, their, their audience was just getting older and older. Relevance, like, I mean, if we want people to, if we want to be legitimized, we have to have something to do with the current conversation, the cultural zeitgeist, and I think that's a bigger issue than, than maybe subsidies. Um, yeah, I think you're perfectly right. Um, it's funny, uh, only now they are trying to orient themselves on a, uh, on a younger audience, and that's because they can, otherwise the government will stop financing them or their, some of their supporters. So they're not re it still that seems that they're not really interested in having an audience. It's about keeping up traditions, about the high esteem of the, uh, the opera, etc., and it's not really about an audience. But then again, I'm not against uh, um, performing art companies specializing on an older audience. They have a right to have their solemn, uh, you know, with the much protocol and ritual. No, of course, but you can't do it all. There's no market indeed. So if you are oriented on the market, you specialize. Some go for the younger people, try to uh, get invest uh, young, uh, more informal ways, etc. Forget about this, yeah, classy art. Yeah? Try to go over the border. Not just mix uh, popular art and, and uh, high art, but um, yeah, change the etiquettes and uh, some go for this, some go for that, uh, but mixing is not always good. It's a good point. I'm sure, I mean, is there, is, do you think, do we think that there are like places where the average age is actually going down while the uh, international opera is going up or it's just, everyone just gets, all, gets older? So, oh. 
Yeah, well, um, I come from Latvia, uh, yeah. Eastern Europe, and uh, I recently did some, uh, uh, just looked at uh, participation rates, and we have actually the group which is attending Oprah the most is the youngest people, and I was thinking that it, it maybe is also something to do with how young people are well off or they aren't well off, because, well, because we, ha we have a young country, uh, like not young country, but like young in recent country, then uh, young people have more opportunities in some ways in order to make businesses and do those kinds of things. So they're more taken uh, seriously than they are, for example, even in Holland. That's my personal opinion. So maybe that also has to do something with how those things are, because people, uh, young people, they also can start affording to go there and they um, get more mature in an early age in order to be able to yeah, consume serious uh, Social ladder. You have still still a chance to rise on the social ladder. So you go for the uh, uh, you know the four things like the opera. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to say uh, regarding the uh, the older audience for opera and classical music. I think it's really evolving actually because I specialized in that in uh, my master's degree, and now like you can see uh, across Europe uh, in the operas in the Philharmonic Orchestra, they are organizing. Uh, um, communication campaign to touch young people. For example, uh, three weeks ago in Paris, there was a philharmonic flash mob. Mm -hmm. So in the middle of the Gare du Nord, suddenly like the whole philharmonic orchestra of uh, France Inter just uh, like popped in and like slightly like began to play around, and, uh, you know, flash mob. So I think it's, uh, yeah, it's not so uh, square and uh, it's evolving slowly. It's, I think it's a good sign. So the situation in the, with the operas is not everywhere as everywhere as bad as apparently in, in New York. And Latvia is good. The people are going out there. They're enjoying themselves. They go there. I just have a question about the flash mob. Who, who paid the flash mob or were the, were the flash mob paid? It was organized by the Association of the French Orchestras. And uh, yeah, it's an association who is, uh, which is mainly uh, subsidized, I think. Uh, but yeah, that's about, I don't know about the financing, but uh, yeah. Oh, uh, they, they are professional players, yes. So they are paid to do that. So it was more like a marketing exercise then, rather than the traditional flash mob thing when people are just go like, ah, yeah, let's yeah. just go out in the rain and play a little bit on our oh, instruments yeah, and just trash them. It was not a spontaneous um, meeting uh, agreed on Facebook. It was really uh, something organized. It was part of the communication campaign, but it really, really worked. I mean, the, the rating on Facebook, the number of views, like, exploded, and I'm pretty sure it's not 65 years old people who were, like, uh, clicking on Facebook to watch the video, so, yeah. <laughs> but I think there's something to be said for the fact that, you know, Can you come a US bit closer? Because I'm just going to have a bit... bit uh, Touch his shoulder <laughs> over time. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> right, right, right. No, but I think there's something to be said: the fact that if there's subsidized, like certain things, like classical music, for instance, in Europe, it's more subsidized, obviously. So they can afford to lower their prices for younger people. At least that's what we have in the Hague, you know. So if you're under 27, you can go to these concerts, and they're more accessible for us than if you have in the U.S., where it's privatized and it's much more expensive. So you only have very select people who can actually afford to go. And so yeah, it's more diverse in Europe. But then again, they're also heavily subsidized, so they're not so self-sufficient. So we can only, I mean, we can subsidize these things in the, in the rich uh, Western economy, right? Yeah, I think it, it, in France and uh, yeah, also here, there are really, uh, like, there are ways to go to the opera and to Philharmonic Orchestra really regularly for nothing. I go every week for five euros. But the problem is there's not enough uh, communication around it because uh, students don't know about it. Like last year, I was uh, doing the master's degree at uh, Erasmus University, and uh, at the end of the year, only people were studying culture, and art and culture. Oh my God, they didn't even know about it. Like that, it costs five euros to go to the Philharmonic Orchestra. And this is outrageous. This is a really big mistake of communication on the part of the uh, art institution. So. It's a bit, a bit ridiculous. You're just popping up. Have, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting. I'm just really looking forward to the next time when you're popping up somewhere.
It's, it's, it's a really good example. I would recommend everyone to do this. You don't forget about getting some new drinks. I'm sure yeah. they have so plenty there. It's a bit ridiculous eh, that you have to get people in for five euro. The same people are prepared to, to pay 40 euro for a, concert, a pop concert. Yes, 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 my dear. The prices of pop, pop concerts are now 50% higher than the average price of a pop concert is 50% higher yeah, than, than of a classical they concert. They are sure to have a good time. For classical music, they ah, don't know they about it. But no, <laughs> no, but that, that's true because people, who, young people who go to classical concerts don't know if they're going to enjoy it. That's the thing. They are going, but they are like, mm, okay, I'm going, they, but probably they know not. very well that before. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, but uh, that's the thing. <laughs> Not true, absolutely not true. And the, most of the people who go for the first time are really surprised that they actually know most of the composers that are being played. And they don't, they don't even know that they know about it. Do you know what I mean? But you pay 40 euros to go to a pop concert because you are sure to have a good time. You know, you are, you are reluctant to pay 20 euros to go to the Philharmonic Orchestra because you're thinking, okay, I've been there once in my life, maybe in 30 minutes I want to run out of it. And, yeah. Mozart doesn't change eh? very much from the first to the hundreds uh, yeah, <laughs> performance. Yeah, well, but a pop concert can but be very but maybe, they, don't, maybe, they don't even maybe know. The they don't even know that. So how? For example, you can make remakes of operas, which are with, um, like, I don't know, I've seen Carmina, which is in a new set or something. So it does change. It, it's not like, would probably see a nice um, opera singers in jeans. Maybe that would attract them more instead of them being in the regular... <laughs> <laughs> well, not me, for example, but maybe some people. <laughs> yeah. So very boring. Yeah. So maybe, maybe can this be the problem? Is just simply is it just not changing enough? So maybe the operas. I mean, do we need operas in the future, or we just need to forget about it and just uh, come up with new art forms which are more uh, needs shorter attention span? Actually, I'm not too sure that the atmosphere is something that puts people off. Actually, it brings them in because students are really uh, eager to make an impression on their fellow students and say, oh, I went to an opera or I went to a classical music concert. And then it sounds really fancy. And if suddenly everything was really popular and you could scream in the middle of a concert and you can clap in the middle of a concert, then it wouldn't be so fancy anymore. And like just last week, I brought someone in who had never been to a, to a Philharmonic concert and he was so, so stressed about it. But he loved it. He loved it because he loved also the whole ritual, like the whole formal ritual. And he, was, he felt really uh, important having to, you know, like not clap at certain moment and clap at certain moment and, and so on. You know? And is he a re representative? I think he could be. The only problem is that just young people uh, d are not informed about it. They, they think it's not for them because it's too expensive and uh, they think they won't find fellow, uh, fellow uh, young people uh, there. But um, it could get really popular and I believe it will. <laughs> I really do. All right. Uh, okay, here you go. Well, I think that goes back to the question of like, how do you value culture when you're not sure what, your value, what it's for? So you're saying, okay, well, they'll go to a pop concert because there's a chance that they'll meet somebody who might want to go home with them. Um, and that's oh, not necessarily the case in the class. Well, it's All true. Right, People will go to a pop concert point. because it's, it's a good opportunity to meet members of whichever sex you happen to be interested in. And I think that that's, uh, that's quite significant in terms of what people will invest money in and how they spend it. So maybe there just needs to be exactly a bit of sexing up. Some jeans, I think. That's the best suggestion so far. <laughs> you see, you see, it's an uh, uh, opera and classical concert getting more and more sexy. The tea break in between and the tea break is really sexy. It will, it is upcoming. <laughs> I believe it, really. You will see. You will see. Uh, I'd just like to draw attention to the fact that there have been operatic uh, productions which do feature plenty of sex and nudity. X rated operas are not uncommon. That's perhaps why the price is so high. But, you know, they are out there. I've seen quite a few of them, in fact. Yeah, there was actually, um, I'm just remembering what Saul said about the GLC. Uh, back in the day, there was uh, a company in London that was doing um, very, very high standard opera with the London Sinfonietta called the Opera Factory. And they were doing cheap tickets. They were doing fantastically innovative stagings of classics and modern operas. And, you know, I saw a lot of these operas when I was in my teens. And that really, you know, instilled in me a feeling that the opera is not, in fact, boring. In fact, the opera can be an amazing spectacle. It can be fabulous. I mean, you know, just really something that I can't describe. And um, 
So yeah, so I think you know the perception that these things are, are are somehow dull. I agree with you. It's because people just don't get them. They're just not informed. Yeah. Um, there seems to be a, a division between people who who think it is about the content, and there are two people who say it's about the making connections and meeting other peoples, and uh, I think this is an important uh, uh, difference. And I I'm on your side. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. It's important because you meet people. It's, that's what you were talking about. Art is something what we can talk about. We can we can measure each other. We can figure out a little bit more about each other. I don't know. Is it, it's a, maybe it's, can it be the problem that opera is yeah, not it's good it's for a, it's this? It's definitely about both. I mean, I never I never thought that uh, the social aspect of it was not important. It's essential, obviously, for young people. For, young people. Um, for instance, in the Hague, as you can read in the. The book uh, Eline Vere from Louis Couperes. People really went there to show themselves and, and be seen, see others. And that, uh, so that was the social aspect. Hang on, I have to give the microphone for him and then and we will come back to you. Yeah, I'm from Korea. And, oh, nowadays, ballet is very pop getting popular in Korea. But the reason is that the ballet is not interest uh, in Korea. Uh, ballet and b-boying is mixed, one musical is mixed, so uh, young people go to see the b-boy and then they, s they see the ballet together and they get, they get interest in ballet. So I think that making touching, po touching point is very important, I think, like this. But they go to see the uh, b-boying but they see the ballet too and they get, in get, they get interest in ballet too. I think that making Mm. So what, 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 what is this piece? B-boy? Sorry, I, d I didn't get Yeah, uh, break dance. Oh, break dancing. So, but do they actually know that there will be also an, uh, a ballet? Yeah, yeah. One or they one, just go yeah. for B-boy and then suddenly all these girls in tutus? Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or B-boy, B-boy, B-boy. Oh, yeah. One break dancer and one ballet dancers are getting uh, together. Uh -huh. oh, I think that okay. that's so very good. So mixing uh, we'll up different types of cultural yeah. kind of institutions and art forms can help to dilute the boringness of the apparent boringness of the ballet and hence become sellable is it is it is this the message of this or is it is it again just as normal i just get everything wrong sorry i still don't think that you have to change the high art into more commercial it's i think the it's better to improve the this connection and explaining to people that what we have is already good but to involve some commercial art into high art. Sorry. I think a lot of this has to do with education, though, because like what you're saying and what she said about her friend who's never been to an opera before. You know, if we have children at a younger age more engaged than, and knowing what, you know, they're, not just what they're seeing, but knowing what it, yeah, what it is, I guess, then it would probably be better all around. So if orchestras could be more flexible and like have children shows where everybody dressed up as sorts of people to center class, and I think that would help, you know. Um, yes, I think that would help. But <laughs> at the same time, I think um, getting your friends to go to the orchestra for the first time, going to the opera for the first time, it's a really great experience. But I think the challenge is more than just getting them in the door the first time, but it's having them come back for a second, for a third, to have them being regular customers, so to speak. Um, because once you go to the, the opera once, you can say, I went to the opera, check, I got that culture done. And then, okay, I've been to the ballet once, check. I've been to the museum, check. And it's kind of a checklist then you can mm -hmm. create for yourself. So I think it's a more of a challenge, rather than just ticking off the boxes, um, to getting people to come back and to be more interested than just one time. Okay, yeah. uh, but uh, wh why those people you think who are regulars in opera, are they actually going for the content or is it more like the, the, the connection between people who are thinking in the same way or other ways? So that's, that's, we are coming back to this question. Uh, of value or entertainment or serious art or entertainment or there were many. Uh, so what is your point going there? Is it like being entertained or is it more for going there for people and discuss things? I think it's for both. I, I think it's both. You have the sub subscribers who go because they love mm -hmm. to see and they get a discount if they buy 10 shows at once. Mm -hmm. Or you have the subscribers who go because they get to meet their friends because they're also subscribers and mm -hmm. they get to say they're a subscriber so I think it's both mm -hmm. okay 
But maybe it's not a the thing what you heard. Her checklist is a very good idea. In fact, instead of subsidizing uh, institutions, you could give everybody, every citizen, a voucher for all this with this total checklist. And all these shows are for free. And that's all you're going to get. Uh. Uh, you know, uh, you, you try, you have a first time, so you know you're well informed and you decide not to go again. Okay. But you might still really like it. I've been to the opera, I think, twice, and I've said, yeah, I like the opera, but I've only been twice. Do I plan on going again? Not in the near future. My point is that these people are very well informed, also young people. It's just blaming them for not being educated, blaming education, it makes it so easy. No, we are very well informed and we decide not to go, maybe not because of the content, but because of the etiquette. We don't like it. Mm -hmm. but I don't. Okay, so uh, the big question is that what, what kind of art forms would make it to your uh, list of free events? Uh, would would the B-Boy be on this list too, or just serious art forms would be there? Oops, sorry. I don't know. Uh, was, have you got an answer for this? Total Rainbow. Let's let's. Uh, if it has an educational value, it's it's like education. Uh -huh. Okay. So who is going to decide uh, who ha what is uh, what has educational value and what hasn't? Uh, screw education. Maybe we should make it localized instead. So you should learn to support your local arts instead, like a small local theater group or something. You know, because I think if you. Groups have stronger commun like communication, strong connections with their local, yeah, community. It would be better. Yeah? Okay, so what well, it doesn't matter what kind of art form is it. It just has to be local, and then it is more. Yeah, exactly. You you at least learn about something about your support, area. Like local smaller groups as well. I think okay. that's the idea because they they're the ones that really need support. Mm, okay, so we were talking. We spent the last half an hour about talking about high art. What about low? And no art, sorry. Well, I, I think this is quite this is this is interesting. The idea of local, in some ways, makes me cringe because I can think of all the local theatre that I've been to with my dad in Norwich, and it is just a disaster. <laughs> because it, I'm not involved in it, so I don't care that Pat from the butcher shop is playing Hamlet, and that it's great to hear him say something apart from pound of bacon, because. <laughs> But when people ask me what my musical taste is, I remember this real transition from being a teenager before the internet was available to me. And people would ask you what music you were into, and it was really important because it meant that's who you were. And so you had to construct your identity around these kind of brands which were available to you. And, to, and then I remember it was just completely losing that once I was able to access culture made by people who I had a connection with. And so now when people ask me what kind of music I like, I tend to say, well, music by people that I know. Because otherwise, how the hell do I choose? There's so much out there. And when it's by somebody that I know, I have a, a, access to a level of understanding of that music, which goes far beyond what's available to me in a commercial context. So I think that there's a lot to be said for that local, but it's not about geography. It's about um, other forms of, of connection. So what are, what, where are we going to take this conversation? We have been talking about lots of things. Look, but now about, so we talked about opera, we talked about uh, alternative economic models of uh, sharing dance classes, and uh, we have touched a little bit on localism, on values. Where, 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 is the, where is the conversation we want to take this from? What, what are the people who hasn't actually said anything so far interested in, in the most? Is it, is it more the economic aspect of uh, local and uh, low-scale art, or is it more like the, the debate what our speakers uh, introduced uh, before? Who wants, is anyone wants to, or maybe is, is there something else what we want to talk about, or anyone in the audience? I, I found this really interesting, the, the craftsmanship of what is good art? How can you define, like, an, her definition was something which involved lots of craftsmanship, which I agree, actually. I think for me, I'm sorry, I'm going back to my own field of reference, but mm -hmm. um, there's a festival in South Africa in a very small village called Darling, and it's called the Voorkamer Festival, and people buy a ticket for a route, and mm -hmm. you don't know beforehand what you're going to see, uh -huh. but you see at least four performances, mm -hmm. and they're all in people's homes, so you could go to a very affluent part of the city or the village and get to see an opera singer in somebody's 
sort of freestanding fancy house, but you could also end up across the railroad in a township and sit in somebody's shack and listen to a stand-up comedian. Um, and I think at the end of the day, for me, it's about making culture more accessible to mm -hmm. a larger audience. And uh, I mean, I'm speaking from a South African background, but I, there are a couple of festivals where artists voluntarily go into the townships, do performances. And I think it, at the end of the day, it's about reaching out to a, a wider audience than just the audience that we're appealing to at the moment. Um, and I think that also gives you um, more of a sort of um, right to be or right to exist um, mm -hmm. in a sense. I think it's about making it more accessible to, to the masses. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do, we tell, do, you, do you people around here think that this kind of thing could work everywhere in, let's say, here in Rotterdam, or is it like it has to be like a closer knit well, society? That's, a, that's actually my question because Free2 is located in Rotterdam now for, what is it, 60 years or so. But we seem not very good in reaching the normal uh, Rotterdam audience. So, how can we do that? Someone an idea. I don't know, to be honest, if every if all the artists want to reach the general public. I think it's a thing to be an artist, to s put yourself up higher, and to go through that struggle of nobody wants to see my show. It's this stamp of approval that you get. That, unfortunately, I don't, I don't know. Do you think they, they, okay, they're avoiding, actually, public, so just they can complain about something? They can complain about not being liked by the public, but they don't want to be liked by the public. But there's a difference between uh, producing for one another, for your peers, etc., and for the largest possible audience. You know, there are many, yeah, segments, uh, sub-segments. It's nothing wrong uh, with catering for intellectu intellectuals, as long as you have an audience and you are uh, prepared to really work for them. So, uh, yeah, you can specialize, and there's mainstream, and there's specializations, and there's avant-garde, as long as it's keep going and diffuses. Yeah? Some take over. There are V2s which are yeah, less speci specialized, but get your product across. So it's just being interested in getting it across to, to people and see to it that it diffuses, I would say. I think actually there's been two really good... Oops, sorry. There's been two really good suggestions tonight. And uh, the first one was that maybe we could fund everybody who asks for funding. So sort of random distribution of funding, maybe whatever, 25 euros first time so much the second time. But then you also, as an audience member, you go to a random thing. So you completely eliminate choice, both on the production and on the consumption end. I think that would be an amazing way to find it. I would definitely go to every one of my checklists. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you, don't, you can't be sure that it's going to be good. But isn't that, so, isn't that what's happened in mass media generally? Basically, I mean, have you ever switched, switched on the television lately? Have you surfed the internet? Have you seen the kind of rubbish that's out there and how easy it is to consume it on a completely random basis? It's, it, it, that seems to me to be what's going on anyway. <laughs> so it's already happening, except yeah, uh, you don't have to go anywhere because you yeah, can exactly. just uh, consume uh, art yeah. from your uh, desk. But, but the problem is that is tend to be, maybe, maybe not always, but it's a slightly solitary experience, whereas this, this whole idea of the sort of social attendance is eliminated, maybe if it was part of it. Because I can't stand choice. I fucking hate it. I get, I'd much rather not choose anything, just go to the supermarket and put some money in, and then random things come in. I have to make something. That would definitely be my preference. I feel very overwhelmed by choice. I have a very good idea for you, actually. It's just... Oops, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to point out that Saul gets one of those boxes from the farmer's market where he just has random stuff delivered to his door, the groceries, yeah. And also sometimes people put down the shopping basket while they're going to, the, to get some more milk. <laughs> Normally I just pick it up, take it home, and then you sort it. It's, life is brilliant. You start to eat very interesting food. Uh, the question is, how can we... How can we that's, that was a good example of how can we eliminate choice, because... I don't know, is there too many choices here in Rotterdam? Uh, are people suffering from uh, the overabundance of, of choices? Yeah, are you? Is it, is it, is it uh, a problem for you that it's too many things going on and then uh, you just can't devote your time for one another and then uh, you end up sitting at home? Um, no, I don't end up sitting at home, I end up trying to do everything. Okay. That's what I tend to do. Um, but yeah, I, I do find choice um, overwhelming and paralyzing sometimes because mm. there is massive amounts of choice in, in every aspect, almost every aspect of our lives. 
Okay. So you would prefer less choice, uh, less I, options? Maybe not. Maybe I need to revolutionize my kind of relationship with the idea of choice. I don't, uh -huh. know. I don't know. <laughs> on this. I mean, this isn't new. It's like, it's just, the, it's the age that we're living in. We're, there is an overabundance of choice. We do freeze up. There's simply too much choice. There's only so many. There's even a number. I can't exactly remember how much this is. Around 10 choices that a person can actually have before, like, above that certain amount, you freeze, apparently. So this, uh -huh. isn't, this isn't new, <laughs> exactly. But um, I think, it, back to the question of how we can spread V2, I think it's, um, it's obviously selective audience most of the time, what you do present. But still, I mean, we could just mix that with the idea of everybody getting a free ticket. So if you stick either for certain events like yesterday's, you could probably just, we could probably just stick it in every post box. You know what I mean? Like, even if it's just a flyer. You know, because, I mean, this is something that families can come to. For God's sake. You know, like it's not, yeah. So if you, if you made uh, things available for free, then people will just go for the free option, and then it's good for everyone. Uh, yeah, that's a lovely idea, but how do you reach people? I mean, there's tons of free fun out there anyway, and actually reaching people and communicating that free fun when there's so much choice and there's so much confusion out there, you've got a big, big communication problem right there. I mean, I'm just sort of talking in practical terms. That's, that's what I see. I mean, I, I, I think this is a great idea, but it, you know, it's going on already, and it, it's very, very difficult to actually discern things and, and really discover what's actually out there. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm suffering from the same. I normally <laughs> stay at home and, uh, yeah, well, maybe. Um, here you go. Well, I, I, I kind of agree with the, the last comment that um, I find that it, it is very difficult to get an evening of people's time. Mm -hmm. And in the Netherlands, I find that way more so than in Australia. Dutch people are booked up for months in advance. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, I think maybe, I don't know, maybe it needs to move out of this space and into a, the public domain, I don't, I don't know, mm -hmm. so that people are encountering it as they're, as they're doing their daily thing is, is the first idea that springs to my mm -hmm. mind. But do you, do you think this uh, idea of knocking on people's door and uh, going, bringing art to the people could be the future of V2 or any art organization? I'm going to throw that to you. <laughs> no, no, please. Oh. No, I don't have an answer. Uh, well, we should have put this table in the central station or something. And then we have can. The Look, we, I mean, that would be so awesome. I would really love to see that kind of experiment once. Well, we are doing this kind of experiments all the time. So you just have to sign up for our newsletter and then you can see us in uh, now. Actually, there is one table in Dubai. And so we are going around. We are global. But yeah, so you haven't uh, got an answer for the question of no, what's, the, what's the future of art distribution. <laughs> I didn't expect a real answer. But uh, the, have we, has anyone seen something really interesting, new models of distributing art and reaching out? Final thoughts. Time for final thoughts. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, we, but we well, haven't. Because we I was told final thoughts take a long time, actually. Right. I, I was planning to have an interval and everyone can grab some more drinks and loosen up a little bit. Jeez. We have so many things to talk. Anyways, there's so many things we've been talking about. I wish we could have a bit more time. Oh, well, we don't. Anyway, so we came to this point of uh, final thoughts. Uh, is there anything you would like to, uh, well, to put on a table which could uh, point to the future? Oh, wow, that's a drink. Things are getting better towards the end, you see. Um, what's the future of art funding? New models, new ideas, old models in a, in a remixed way. Um, any ideas? <laughs> yeah, we haven't heard you. You, you were sitting here and then you were like, hmm, mm, interesting. The questions bla uh, stay the same all the time. That's, that, that's no problem, especially now, because um, now I want to say one thing. We are talking about um, the, the audience. We are talking about uh, financing, and what um, we uh, we are financed by the government most of the time. Most of the money came from there, and now we are talking about the audience. And the, in the in the audience, we. Uh, are looking for our friends, and the friends are not the same as the people who pay us. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of dilemma, and we, we are changing now 
from the government to our real friends. And that's the, the kind of thing I feel now in the air. And that's, that's, that's very important now that you make the change uh, really now, I think. Being, is it like being okay. uh, uh, looking financed for, locally? Uh, looking for our friends, and that's more or less the, the public we, we have already for, a, for most of the time. Okay, I think it's. I think localizing funding is is a great idea as long as your friends are rich. Um, any other final thoughts? <laughs> was it? Was it? Well, yeah, I think that's the point that Diane, one of the points that Diane was making. It's great for the organisations who have rich friends. Oh, I see. Well, right. Is it? You need friends in the first place, and then you have are looking for friends who have money. I guess if you want nice friends, you have to be a good artist first time now. I don't know. Maybe it's, I'm living in this utopistic dream. Probably I am. Anyways, uh, if no one else wants to put down his final thoughts on the table. So I have final thoughts. Everyone should have some final thought. Um, well, yeah, that's so in mine, Everyone has to. Uh, I, th I think that the discussion has been... A, it's a tricky one because it, the, the idea of what art is worth always slips from uh, the, the kind of personal to the political. And once it hits the political, it seems no longer to make sense um, in terms of how we experience it. Uh, so I guess I, I think I really like the idea of random funding and random cultural reception because it kind of eliminates so many of the institutional problems. Uh, and I, okay, it's probably not the most popular idea. I think you'd struggle to sell it to people. But um, I, I definitely think that there's a lot more to be said for funding something. We should fund something. But what it is, I don't think matters that much. Uh, because people will find a way to support their creative practice. And that's what used to happen in, in England, in London. My experience was that when it was possible to get uh, the income support easily, then artists were on income support. Then when it was possible to get arts funding, they got arts funding. When it's possible to work in a university, they worked in universities. Now, none of those are possible anymore. I don't know how people are going to make money. Um, but, you know, they'll, they'll, there's be, there'll be something. So there should be money available, but what for? I don't think it matters. Okay, great. Final thought? Come for us right now. Um, well, I guess my final thought is that I, I, I would like to move away from only using money. I'd like to move to the... You know, I want to make a living. I don't need to make a profit. I need to make a living. I need to support myself. I need to have. I need to feel like I have a rich and healthy life. That's what I. Well, that's what I want. So um, I think there are multiple ways of, of achieving that. Mm -hmm. Final I'm still thinking a lot about your conversation, and I think that the uh, the degree to which we're, we're not. We're not part of the cultural conversation sometimes in the in the fine arts in particular. Um, you know, I'm in my 40s, and I would go see I don't know 150 performances a year when I was living in New York, and often I mean not at all venues. At some venues I would go, and it would feel like it does in the Netherlands, where you'd see a really diverse crowd, and it would be young and hip. But if I was going to sort of a traditional, you know, an orchestra, an opera company, or even a really sort of fine art, serious theater sort of venue. I would be easily 25 or 30 years younger than most people, you know? And so you're sitting there thinking, like, I wonder what all the, like, hip 40-year-olds are doing tonight. Like, you know, they're clearly <laughs> not here. And I just think that, that that ability to be part of the conversation, and I, I don't know if that's exactly what, what you meant with that, but I, I keep thinking about it and thinking that that's something we have to pay attention to. Yeah. Oh, should I give it back to you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well. No, I don't have particularly uh, final thoughts. I just uh, wonder, like, we have this this uh, funds for starting artists in the Netherlands and with the uh, argument for fun, just giving subsidy to everyone who wants it. Um, the, the starting artist is used it for two years of doing nothing. So where do you start and where do you end with funding everyone who just uh, wants some subsidy? So that's just what I was mm -hmm. wondering. What you could do is finance everyone once and see what they make out of it. Yeah, but so yeah, if, we, if someone makes something out of it, then it's worth to finance it again. But then everybody gets a chance to, yeah. to show that they are able to make something. A second final thought? Uh, the last thought. Well, we are talking about institutions, and I'm, uh, I, uh, 
I hope that there will be uh, in, in the future more direct connection between the artist and the audience because a lot of problems are in, in, in the institutions as well. So I, I'm not so hopeful about the functioning of the institutions. Anatole? I'd like to hear round table microphone giving. Oh, thank you very much. I'd like to hear your, well, your people sitting around. Good. <laughs> We're good. Final thought? Yeah. From under the table? We, under didn't, the we didn't solve the legitimization crisis. Uh, the, but, Not uh, yet. The, no, but it's, we are aware of it, it seems. Everybody is sort of thinking aloud, and it has to do with this crisis. Sorry? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, you have to make... Uh, it's not, no longer self-evident that art is good and has goodness. So we have to think about it and we have to prove it and each and every its the own way and someone is catering for a, for a high audience, well, someone for a lower audience, but you have to get the response. And it's not just from the government or some elite who says it's good. So that's it. Final thought? Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> my head hurts. <laughs> um, uh, no, my actual final thought is more like a sort of desperate one, short term thought in terms of like, the fact that no matter what the political atmosphere is, we're more inclined to support the higher arts, I think. And that's because, you know, it's up to politicians, particularly politicians who know nothing about art in general. Um, and so really the question always remains is how, to, how smaller groups and such are beginning to really support themselves and find ways to sustain themselves regardless. Um, I think we're living in very beautiful era where we have lots of choices and lots of chances to do what we want. So I think the art sector will also adjust with the time and even with the cut of subsidies. Uh, they're full of creative people. That's what the art is. They're creative, so they will find a way. They sort of tired. <laughs> I'm very op optimistic. <laughs> I'm delighted to hear such a young person sounding so optimistic, actually, because, uh, yeah, I, I, I really fear for the future. But what I wanted to say was uh, I think that uh, we've got a real problem in terms of, uh, and, and this is an age-old problem. This is not something which is just, like, new for this, this era. It's uh, something which is uh, um, the commodification of art and creative work is uh, always something that we kind of struggle against. For instance, I know, you know, quite a lot of amazingly talented people who work in advertising. And, uh, you know, that to me is, is, is such a sort of prostitution of your creative soul that uh, it just seems like, you know, <laughs> I would rather do anything than make a dancing crisp packet on the internet, you know. Mm. But uh, that's that, that it works for them and, they, you know, they're able to make a living out of that. Uh, so um, what I think is really the problem here, <laughs> what I think is really the problem is... is, is Don't worry, they can't say okay. anything anymore. All right, all right, right. okay. What I think is the problem is that, is that there are so many sort of definitions of what art and artistry actually is. And we've heard this story about uh, these um, uh, institutions which get tons of money and don't really do anything. And we've heard the story about, uh, you know, the Norwich Community Theatre. And we've heard sort of all sorts of things which kind of go on in between, good, bad, and indifferent. And um, I think that, you know, there's no way that we can really codify what art is and, uh, except for by what response it provokes in us. And, you know, if there's something that speaks to us kind of deeply and emotionally, then maybe that's art. And it could come from just about anywhere. It, but, I mean, you could also, you, you can get that response from nature. There are all sorts of ways you can get the response. So, so, you know, what is it? Why do we make art? Why are we doing it? And, and you know, what, what happens to it when you start commodifying it? Which is, I think, the important question is that what happens when art is a commodity and when you actually pay for that transaction and you turn it into something which, is, which has that you know, responsibility of actually accepting money for it. And that's my last thought. Okay. No last thought? Uh, I wonder whether we will see in the next decade uh, um, performances with more interaction getting more popular. It would be the proof of the pudding. Wow. Um, yeah, I don't know. You're the last one with the yeah. final. So that's the, that's <laughs> the final, final. Oops. oops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, maybe it sounds a bit cheesy, but I'm I'm really pleased to have this. Yeah, it's a good. Yeah, sure, sure. Up, uplifting, Shall I say it? Up, yeah. Uplifting and cheesy. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just so grateful that we could have this conversation here, <laughs> <laughs> while every other person is 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 drinking outside on a Friday night after a long week of work, and we're talking about art. And I think, wow. <laughs> I mean, yeah, this is like the. The artist vitamins I can survive a month from. So, <laughs> thanks a lot, guys. Thank you very much for everyone. And uh, the bar is still open. And thank you for V2 for having us here. And hopefully, we will see you very soon uh, for the second part of this conversation. And thank you to the people speak. Can we have a big round of applause for the people speak? Ooh. So stick around, there are more zillionaire cocktails at the bar, and uh, continue the conversation at the bar. Thanks for coming. You can actually, you can actually uh, continue the conversation at the table sitting here, except I won't be in the middle.